of Sephiroth. And um, in that project, we try to explore separation of powers in 21st century Europe. And it's our particular pleasure today to have uh, two professors from the University of Bremen, Susanne Schmidt, Professor of Policy Field Analytics, and I saw Dean of the Social yeah. Sciences now yeah, for already <laughs> four years. So we are particularly happy that nonetheless, uh, you managed to come and join us. And of course, Susanne was also our guest pre-COVID, that must have been 18, I think. Yeah, I'm not. Pre-COVID yeah. as yeah, a visiting pre researcher <laughs> at, um, at ACES, the Amsterdam Center for European Studies, and um, Philip Manon, and Manon, sorry, Manon, uh, who is mainly focusing on national electoral and legislative politics, if I'm not mistaken. I couldn't particularly find a title on your website, but you're joining us also from the University of Bremen. And we are very interested in hearing how the rule of law crisis plays out and is a sh and shows, as your paper promises, a failure of auto limitation in the multi level context in the EU and what we can learn from that for our project. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Christina. Thanks for the invitation and thanks to you all for for joining. Um, this was really a very nice um, occasion for us, very nice deadline. We decided early January would be good to do a paper together. <laughs> I was so kind to invite uh, Philip along and so this, yeah, we finished it on Friday and I think some of you may have seen it. Let me, um, let me just start um, to uh, give you the overall idea now and then we have some slides. <laughs> to run through. Um, when I uh, teach uh, European uh, law, I always say um, it's uh, unusual, of course, for, uh, for the European Court of Justice to have this power. And what is important to understand uh, this power is the integrated court system. Because through the integrated court system, through <laughs> references, reaching the European Court of Justice via any national court, there is like no political um, handle on court cases coming. There's a lot of case law developing, allowing it uh, to, to further uh, development of EU law. And most of all, if member states don't like what comes out of it, they would have to intervene their own uh, against their own courts, and that's a high barrier. So that's for me like a really important aspect of the power of European law, of the power of the European Court of Justice. And what we do now in this paper is in a way what I, I'm not sure if any international relations scholar is here, and if there were, I think they call it a second image reversed, and that's like how does this feedback on the national level? What does it mean? And that's something which, um, of course, we know there's a lot of um, literature on preliminary references and everything, but that hasn't really been reflected what that means <coughs> for national polities to have this integrated court system. And uh, as Christina said, uh, Philip is doing more comparative um, politics, uh, democracy, and, and so we've been discussing. Uh, discussing this and what does it mean. So let me um, run through uh, the argument. I'm not sure do you, I have to put this a bit somewhere else, but I, maybe like this. Um, so the overall argument is um, courts, of course, are dependent. We take a strategic model as a theoretical frame here and um, say it's actually yeah, has to be explained how can courts have power and in this more rational choice tradition the idea of course is courts are dependent on the other branches decisions rulings need to be implemented and so it depends courts rule in a context of cost and benefits to the other branches. And this idea of auto limitation, um, which is based on the law of anticipated reaction, describes this delicate balance between the separation of powers between the different branches of governments. Um, there is a mutual consideration 
the, the court kind of has to look um, what do the will will the executive will government implement what I'm ruling or will it uh, will it not and um, research shows uh, that the firm constitutional court uh, GCC abbreviated here actually does look um, so we look uh, have a small part on the German constitutional court and then we look uh, with this argument that it's actually normal I mean the German constitutional court of course in the case model with decades of um, experience is a prominent constitutional court and even there you do have uh, political conflicts um, you have constant uh, balancing and if we look at the European uh, level with the ECJ we see that there's a lot more positive uh, feedback to activism than there is uh, feedback to restraint and this means uh, then the question, um, what does this mean for the national level? Um, that's the concern. Uh, and the idea here is that the um, because uh, the multi level system and preliminary references bring judicial review into each national member state, irrespective of the kind of tradition of separation of power, and tradition of national auto limitation. This sets free the, um, the judiciary. And whereas normally in the national context, you would have a bitter conflict between the constitutional court and parliament and the executive. Um, now this permeates throughout the court uh, system, hence uh, rule of law crises. And, um, so the idea is, uh, there was this paper by Larsen uh, on different constitutional uh, legacies uh, with this, uh, three systems, post-fascist model um, and uh, evolutionary and the post-communist model. And that actually in the national context, it would be play out differently. And this now um, also has different impact we see and this will be something we can discuss we only uh, touch about, uh, on it so far in the paper in germany of course we see that the eu level really brings in a conflict with the constitutional law but not with politics politics is really a pre a pro european in the post communist uh, context um it's different uh, it's the conflict with um with politics but not with courts so this is uh, the argument and there are um, slides on the different, um, each one slide on, on each of the different uh, um, <clears throat> steps of the argument. And uh, I will turn to Philip um, then when we come to the preliminary reference procedure because he um, computed there, uh, analyzed the data. So what is uh, the theoretical framing? we use uh, it's uh, the strategic model as i say and of course there's a huge literature one could turn to uh, also a uh, in in terms of political theory why would the powerful uh, accept constraints by an independent judiciary um the answer is that there are um, benefits of having an independent judiciary and that's um these benefits relate to information advantages, the powerful see who is taking recourse at courts, where are the worries, for instance, there's blame shifting, one can delegate conflictual decisions. Um, there's also the delineation of competences very importantly in federal models. Uh, and one important argument is also this insurance argument. Uh, it's, it's an insurance because when in times of opposition, um, you know there is an independent judiciary. So you accept constraints now um, because you profit from it later. Of course, that only counts if there is this risk of finding yourself in opposition. It's something which doesn't really apply at the EU level. Um, 
there's a lot of public support uh, for independent courts, so um, that's important as a cost of restraining them. And um, so if we see these costs and benefits, uh, the um, yeah, this uh, theory of auto limitation then draws on the law of um, anticipatory reactions. Each branch knows the other can um, intervene or does not do uh, what one expects them to do. So you are careful and there's a constant, and there's a constant uh, rebalancing really. I'm not so sure, and that would also be maybe something for discussion, um, uh, the kind of blame shifting, um, I think, that is not really well reflected in this uh, balance or the strategic uh, model, not as much as one would hope for. And obviously in the EU, that's an important consideration. Um, so let's uh, turn to the German constitutional court. As I um, say, I, there are good reasons to look at, at the German constitutional court uh, being such a prominent uh, court, but I think in our context here, what is important is that the research shows very clearly that auto limitation plays a role. The court constrains itself looking whether government will be prepared to respond. Of course, the court doesn't always get it right, but the same is Gang nach Karlsruhe, going to Karlsruhe. Um, it's always clear in lawmaking, the opposition may, may go to Karlsruhe. This will fail in Karlsruhe, important arguments. So in policy making, it's always an important argument and this constrains the options. So we have, um, we have a constant assessment of scope and limits of the respective mandates. And importantly, there is bitter conflict, or there always used to be bitter conflict. Um, and I think that's interesting in the rule of law crises, where uh, political interference with independent courts is now uh, so banned. It's not really, if it's not accepted anymore, what does this mean if actually constitutional courts are always once in a while contentious. Um, they have to see their limits. So it's kind of to the idea of having a powerful constitutional court, it's normal to have strong political contention. And that's kind of um, uh, for forgotten. And um, nowadays, of course, the political contention with the German constitutional court relates to its uh, EU critical jurisprudence. Whereas before there were many instances being critically discussed about national, uh, national policies. Okay, so if we uh, turn to the European Court of Justice, and I'm sure we can also have interesting discussion in how far there's self-restraint or not self-restraint, I'm always a bit, um, I always have to be a bit careful that I don't kind of overdo it and how far it's an activist court. And then I see it's not always activist, of course. But I think if we look at this strategic model, we see that there aren't many counter forces because if we see on the horizontal level, it's the commission, it's the parliament, they all share the um, pro-integration, uh, even, uh, even the council in a way, the whole auto limitation, what one would expect for courts to show the limits need to be in the vertical um, dimension with the member states, but does it really play out via the council? No. Does it play out via national courts? Not really. I always refer here to Gareth's paper of um, with the with Brexit that if if EU law was such a problem, why didn't British courts kind of <laughs> point to it and <laughs> react differently? Um, so there isn't much uh, auto limitation, and we have a very vibrant EU law community, as we know, which actively pushes uh, for case law developments. 
last year, uh, Tommaso Pavone, he puts it down not to the lower courts uh, with judicial empowerment thesis, but uh, to just two dozens of law firms, I must say. Um, I, I still have to read the book, of course, but that really shocked me how, how much there is a capture that historically, I mean, we all knew with FIDE and the associations and how much it, this has been construed, this strong, um, but um, it's, it's worrying. Um, so there are strong incentives to at blame shifting and delegation. And there is, um, it's difficult to overrule uh, judgments. And there is, of course, not much uh, critical feedback uh, from the public sphere. And, but I mean, maybe in, in general, one has to say as well, there would need to be more critical discussion of European integration in general. We also don't have it about um, policy making in the EU. So that's um, the EU level. And, um, so the idea is normal at the national level, strong incentives for auto limitation of constitutional courts, not really incentives uh, to constrain activism at the EU level. Of course, it's not an activist ECJ throughout, but um, in general, EU law has been progressing at an enormous rate. And if it stops at certain moments, like we've seen with EU citizens, non-discrimination, it's kind of stopping and um, will progress probably sometime again. Okay, so um, let's look at the multi-level multi -level perspective. Um, at the multi-level perspective, uh, we have the different cities of member states, um, as I said, and that would also that would be really interesting, as I say, for the German constitutional law in this post-fascist constitutionalism. It has been quite well shown in research. Um, this idea of auto limitation. Uh, we know from the Scandinavian evolutionary constitutionalism that it's much constrained in terms of uh, preliminary rulings, who should do it and how far um, it's, it's a legitimate option to overturn national policies to simply turn to judicial review. So we have different, um, different mechanisms of auto limitation in the on the, in the national uh, context. And the idea now of this, uh, of this paper and, um, and the data uh, Philip has assembled uh, on the preliminary reference procedure is now that if we have this integrated court system, um, the preliminary reference procedure really allows to bypass what we have established national uh, mechanisms of auto limitation because now national courts of all levels, they can use judicial uh, review and they are not um, constrained to the same extent as they were before they profit from this extraordinary um, autonomy, which the ECJ enjoys in this strategic model. So um, I don't know whether I should uh, turn over here to, um, to Philip. Um, so we, we should explain, uh, we should expect auto limitation to be uh, less constraining um, and yeah, maybe I turn turn here to Philip, okay. and then yeah, uh... yeah. In a in a in a way, auto limitation is a separation of powers explanation because it would say, okay, once you once court have control or or can check politics, politics always have to anticipate whether a court will judge um, a law as unconstitutional 
but since courts have no sword, uh, courts would also always need to anticipate whether there will be evasion of judgments by politics. So that, that so way auto limitation is not is just another way of, of formulating the me mechanics of of um, of, uh, of of separation of powers. And if if it's true that these the limitation considerations of the strategic game between politics and uh, law is much, much less prevalent um, on the EU level out of the reasons that Susanne uh, outlined, then the national courts at all levels can participate uh, in, in this extraordinary autonomy of the ECJ and, and via the preliminary um, reference procedure. And um, and the preliminary preference uh, procedure is nothing other than a judicial review, uh, which then uh, you know uh, judicial review competence, which uh, suddenly with EU membership, it, each and every court in each and every member country has. Um, in a way, I, I just I just came an idea why how we at least might call the chapter now. It's uh, why the why the dog did not bark, uh, so to speak. So in a way, uh, out limitation would always predict that we don't see massive conflicts between uh, politics and law, because both would try to, and, and, and well, once we would see us only as a kind of a kind of calculation mistake, you know, mistaking, uh, mistaking the, the, po the position of, of the executive or, the, or the, the, the salience of an issue for the executive or mistaking the, 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 how, how de determined uh, a court is. So, but only in these, these rare instances where there is some kind of strategic miscalculation, so to speak, usually in, in this law of anticipated, uh, anticipated reaction, uh, the usual uh, question would be why the dog didn't bark but uh, the, the kind of rule of law crisis in Europe uh, uh, would, would point one to the question, why, why didn't the dog not bark, so to speak? So why do we see all the conflict? All the time? And that's uh, the, the, uh, our explanation is why, because the mechanisms of auto limitation are simply um, um, not, not uh, have, no, have no constraints, have no bite uh, in this special, very special constellation of a multi-layered polity, but an integrated, uh, uh, space, uh, legal space. So what we uh, did is um, we we took the the data on preliminary um, uh, uh, reference procedure. Uh, our unit of analysis is more or less country years. So uh, uh, the number of preliminary reference procedures initiated in a country at a special year. So more or less we have. Um, all in all, the data set has something like 1,000 plus uh, observations, uh, but really the, the, the more, so really looking at, at, at when, when the reference procedure starts and then when it becomes more salient and more, more relevant, gives us something like 700, a little bit less than 700 observations. Um, and what we... Uh, we combined this data on on you know how many um, procedures in a country in a year with data um, mainly on government composition. So how uh, the, the kind of center of gravity of a government uh, that means a vote weighted um, position in the in the traditional left right dimension and in the pro anti-EU dimensions. So where, where is this government located on these two dimensions? Um, we also um, asked um, how safe uh, is the parliamentary majority a government enjoys? Um, we have a couple of control variables like a size of the country, which we measure by um, population. We also measured something like number of courts in a country. But this never, 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 ever was um, as, um, statistically uh, significant in any of our specifications. So that doesn't seem to uh, explain uh, much. 
And uh, what we then also um, coded and, and combined in the data set was uh, what were measures of judicial independence, several measures mainly taken from, uh, from the varieties of democracy projects. So the, the data on government composition on the left right dimension, the kind of how, how, how safe a majority is in parliament or how narrow and also government composition in the pro anti EU dimension we gathered from Pargov, uh, from Variety of Democracy, the Weedem project, we gathered this information on how independent courts are and how much um, there are judicial constraints on the executive. And um, yeah, that, and these are mainly our, um, our main explanatory um, uh, variables. And what one would expect in a, in, a, in a traditional strategic game between politics and law uh, in a kind of national context uh, would be that the judiciary um, yeah in, 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 a, in, a, in a normal legal system mainly p courts apex, uh, apex courts so, so the higher courts maybe a constitutional court if there is one would be uh, we would expect it to be more you know, more restrained, more moderate, more, more, more um, cautious of, um, of invoking judicial review, the stronger parliamentary majorities are, which the government enjoys. We would also not really expect a very strong party bias, either in the left-right direction. Well, there is no equivalent in a, in a domestic legal game between politics and law or strategic game uh, of the pro-anti-EU uh, direction, but, but, but in a usual uh, or in a very normal kind of strategic constellation between the court and, and the government, one would also not expect that there are, um, that there are a systematic, that there is a systematic impact of um, government composition. Um, we would expect if, if, if political control over the judiciary is higher or put otherwise, if judicial control over the executive is lower, then we would expect a lower frequency of judicial review in a country. Yeah, and I think this is mainly our, this, this, this would be the kind of normal auto limitation um, um, uh, uh, expectations you would you would get from a normal strategic game and not in a multi-layered quality and so in a, in a way what our framework is a little bit of a non-finding uh, character because we the point is that we all that we don't expect to find that on the European level uh, so maybe you can yeah yes great and so so this is our yeah this is one of our regressions um so this is one of the our basic models um and uh, so what you see here the first two variables are um are these measures taken from uh, from the VDEM project and it's so it's um so it's normal courts or higher courts the independence and what you usually would um expect is that you know uh, the more independent, the more autonomous it gets, the more willing uh, these courts might might be to to invoke uh, judicial review. Here you see exactly the opposite. So uh, the, the the more politics tries to to get a hold, or the less the less the law has control over over the executive, the higher the number. Uh, of, of preliminary uh, reference procedures invoked in a country. The same is true for majority. It's not a negative sign, which you would see, for, uh, which you would expect in a normal strategic game between politics and law uh, in a domestic context um, before that variable, but you see positive. So it, meaning the, the bigger the majority the government has, the more likely uh, a court in a member country is to invoke um, preliminary uh, reference procedure. You don't see an effect of the left-right dimension, at least not a significant one, but you do see one, or we, we see one of the um, pro-anti-EU um, uh, dimension. And in a way, unexpected from an auto-limitation perspective, but in a way expected from our perspective, uh, since um, um, it, it shows that the more anti-EU government is, the more likely a, a domestic and national court is to invoke um, to invoke um, a preliminary pre uh, reference procedure. Um, maybe, uh, so oh, I've- One further? 
Yeah, so this is simply a way of, of, of making a little bit more visually um, uh, accessible, but it's simply simply the same uh, same reference, the same findings. One difference here uh, that we, we uh, yeah, I played a little bit with the data and it obviously seems to be justified to integrate an East European dummy because East European countries systematically um, um, introduce less um, um, less um, preliminary reference procedures than, than Western countries. And that might have something to do with, you know, being more acquainted with the European legal system, having a more dense networks, I don't know, of lawyers uh, who, who have worked since many years with this material and are much more prone to, to exploit uh, the European law to their own purposes, so to speak. Um, yeah. Um, I think we can skip the second table. It's mainly showing the same results with with a different uh, value for judicial constraints. It's a different, uh, but it's showing exactly the same. So it's still an, a positive sign for majorities. So it's not less likely uh, if majorities are, are, are large that it, that the court will introduce a case to the European level, but it's more likely to do so. Uh, also, this judicial constraints is just ex has exactly the same, more or less the same magnitude, and also the same um, uh, direction than before. So it's now not, uh, you know, it's not the independence of higher and lower courts, but it's now generally how 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 constraining is is the, is the law vis-a-vis -vis politics, and that, but that also means how autonomous is politics vis-a-vis -vis law. And, and the more it is, the more uh, this, you know, this preference procedure can be taken. So in a way, you could one could in, interpret this, this in a benevolent way and say, okay, that, that's great. So, so there, there are these national governments trying to get a, get a hold on their legal system. Uh, and, and, and these judges uh, have the possibility to go to, to, uh, to, to Europe. And so the, so the rule of law is secured. So that would be the kind of you know, very benevolent uh, interpretation. But it could also be the case, and I, I think this is more plausible, that governments coming into power, tr seeing that, that they need to get a control, get get that this auto limitation doesn't work and so they try to to to, to get a more direct uh, hold on the judiciary and so that you then have this escalating uh, conflicts which then all also spill over to the general legal system so it's not confined to a strategic game between a constitutional court or a supreme court and the government but then uh, as as you as, as the case, it is that, that each and every cause at each and every level can invoke a, a PRP, um, then, 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 then a government which really for, for which this is a problem will have an incentive to not only to get control over its constitutional court, but to expand its control over the, and then we have this conflict about the disciplinary chamber in, in, in Poland and so on and so on. And so on. But the other, it's just the, the findings are stable, the other findings. Two very last and short uh, and, and, and only uh, kind of visual um, um, findings, if you want, so not really a kind of um, inter interference statistics or no, no regression analysis, um, simply what we also then see if we look at the sheer numbers and at the shares of um, um, between high courts and normal courts, I think it's interesting that in countries like Poland and Hungary, uh, we see a general increase of preliminary um, um, reference procedures. But uh, after, after initially, for instance, when, when Orban comes to power in 2010 or when the, when the PES comes to power in 2015, initially we see an increase of the share of the, of the high courts, which involve um, preliminary reference procedures. And that would be the next. the next. But then over time, uh, you see uh, there's a decreasing share of the high courts, but still an increasing number of, um, of procedures which would uh, give at least some plausibility to an interpretation that, um, that, that, that there is a kind of inbuilt escalation um, um, 
yeah, an inbuilt escalation that once you get control of your constitutional court, you will still then have incentives to get control over the, uh, the more of the legal system since, since the dynamics diffuse and spread, so to speak. So um, some very short um, and, and still very preliminary conclusions. Um, we think that um, our analysis doesn't really prove but suggests that auto limitation doesn't work in a multi-level polity so that, that you see what you usually won't see, na namely um, deep constitutional conflicts. Um, uh, the ECG is largely unconstrained politically and then member state courts can participate um, uh, in this uh, extraordinary autonomy uh, by, via the, the preliminary ruling procedures. And so in a, in a separation of powers perspective, the lack of mediating, so you, you want to have conflict, yes, but you also want to have some kind of mediation of these conflicts. And, and they, do, they don't seem to be there and uh, this proves to be dangerous. That's our Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.